really excited about today. This uh, was a, a group effort to bring together some just fabulous speakers throughout the day. We've got some special events too at noontime and then a panel at 3.30. The entire schedule is in here in this booklet that Danny Lawrence put together. She is awesome. She was the all the, you know, worrying about all the details and really did a fantastic job pulling this together with all the travel arrangements and everything else. So please, when you see her today, thank her uh, profusely. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate all of her effort along with a lot of other volunteers, uh, including the students and some of the staff at the University of New England here. Um, I will do an unabashed plug for the University of New England. We've got our Rising Tide magazines here. These are our scholarship magazines that we publish once a year. It will give you a full kind of taste and of the breadth and the, uh, you know, just the, the overall uh, scholarship atmosphere at, that we are creating at this university. And it's really student-centered, which I think is uh, you know, key to its, uh, success and why we do it in the first place. I also mentioned that we've got an art contest coming up. Uh, September is Pain Awareness Month. And uh, we we're asking artists to uh, put you know, forth exhibits, uh, all kinds of different uh, forms. And we're going to be putting these on display open to the public. Uh, we're working with the downtown group in Biddeford to do this. So it's just one more part of our holistic approach to trying to tackle some of the most challenging problems uh, that you know, public health faces and medicine faces. And uh, the full agenda is uh, also available for you guys to uh, take a look at. So you know, what are the goals of this meeting? As we were talking as a group at UNE, you know, I think we've got a confluence of, of people who are interested not just in the basic sciences and the clinical practice and, and clinical education, but we're also very good at interprofessional education. And we've started to see a lot of our faculty and students get involved with policy and advocacy work. And we work with groups like the Chronic Pain Support Group of Southern Maine, which we've got some uh, people here. We've got uh, distinguished guests that are with uh, Senators Collins, King, and uh, Shelley Pingree's office, Congresswoman Pingree. So we're, we're sh kind of learning as we go on how to engage the public in discussions and to tell them about some of the things that we're doing that we think are very important, but then listening to them, and that informs our research and our education of our students. And we do, again, do this in a very interprofessional manner. So we want to facilitate discussion. I think that's one of the great things that a university does, you know, the symposia, bringing people together and having debate and discussion. Uh, with that and, and having respect, mutual respect for different points of view and trying to move this forward in a positive direction. Uh, I think, again, like I said, that also strengthens the work that we each of us do in our daily lives. We want to start that constructive dialogue with people who are impacted, not just with chronic pain, but others who may be impacted by substance abuse, misuse, addiction. And certainly there is some overlap, but these are also distinct populations too. So, but they have some commonalities. The stigmatization that is associated with chronic pain and substance abuse prevents people from getting early help. And it, it further drives that isolation, that despair that needs to be, you know, kind of dispelled and, and getting that early access. Prevention is always preferable. Early treatment intervention is better than late intervention. But we also want to continue to maintain hope so that people can, uh, you know, work towards, you know, having a higher quality of life with no matter what chronic disease they face. And then finally, you know, I think it's very important with our speakers, we're going to raise awareness of this national pain strategy and another piece of legislation that's been recently passed called CARA, which uh, is the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act. Uh, it's very important that we adequately fund these and embrace these as a unified front uh, to make you know, forward progress. If we don't, we're just going to fall back and cycle you know, between two extremes. And so we've got some experts that are very much involved at the national level in uh, making this happen, and they're going to educate us on that. So first, I want to have uh, Dr. Ian Meng come up to the podium. He is the Center Director for the Center of Excellence in Neuroscience, and he's also the Principal Investigator on our large NIH COBRE grant. And he's just going to give a quick overview of what the Center and the COBRE is about and why it's important, and, and then I'll take it from there. So again, I, I want to thank you all for, for coming, and uh, some of you I know have traveled from out of state. It's a beautiful day, and it's a packed day here, but I hope you have some time to uh, go out and explore a little bit both the campus and, and the uh, area, because it certainly is beautiful. So as Ed mentioned, uh, I'm the director for the Center for Excellence in Neurosciences. Uh, I'm also the PI on a COBRE grant, and this is a grant that is focused, um, our grant is focused on the study of pain and sensory function. Uh, but uh, what I thought I would do is give you a bit of an understanding to sort of put this uh, day into context of what we're doing here at UNE. Uh, and first and foremost, in terms of the work we're doing uh, in building our pain research group here, uh, 
uh, which is one of the primary goals of the uh, COBRI grant. And so that's uh, to support mainly junior investigators and uh, as they are moving up in the, in the pain field and also to try to bring in people who are outside the pain field into our realm, into our world, and, uh, and get sort of their unique perspective on things. And I think that that can really contribute to our conversation. In addition, uh, the grant provides a lot of support for building research infrastructure. And we've been able to do that um, in terms of what we've been able to accomplish with our uh, behavior and imaging and histology cores. Um, so this is sort of the basic uh, diagram, I like to say, of, of, of what, we're, what we're accomplishing in the, in the, in the science of pain. And really we've been focused mainly on the basic science pain research here and building up uh, the research group. We've had a lot of recruitment over the past four years, five years. And, um, and I think that the next round where, where we really see ourselves growing is, is more in this clinical pain uh, group. And we also have a, a pretty uh, nice uh, developed preclinical development team as well. But I think that what you'll see uh, today is that uh, we also think that what we're doing is really a small piece of the puzzle. And, you know, we can't simply uh, think about, uh, you know, doing research on and, and hopefully bringing to the clinic new uh, drug treatments for pain, but we have to um, also think about alternative therapies as well. Um, this is our behavior core, which is directed by Ed Bilski. We can uh, certainly run a lot of different kinds of behavioral assays. We're really moving uh, away from just the simple pain reflexes, which um, is, is historically has been where things have uh, really dominated in the pain research world, um, into more complex behaviors uh, and emotions or the affective side of pain and, and um, being able to, to measure that and quanti quantitate that. Um, in addition, we've been able to build up our imaging and histology cores, and, um, and that's something where I think uh, Eve DeConnick, who's uh, here today, has uh, been a, a tremendous help. And in, in the next uh, phase, we're also, I think, going to be building um, in some in vivo uh, imaging. Um, but again, there's a bigger umbrella to uh, the, the pain research uh, world that we have here on the university campus, and this is the, the uh, Neuroscience Center. And, um, and in addition to supporting uh, the research and scholarship that we do here in, um, in the neurosciences and certainly in pain, uh, we also um, uh, have support for academic programs. And one of the things that we've really tried to do is to integrate the research we're doing into the curriculum. And I think that this is uh, this can really be seen in what we've been able to do um, with the medical school and the curriculum in that program, uh, especially uh, in our ability to bring in um, uh, special case uh, studies, um, in particular those that, that um, are relevant to pain, and to, to really bring that to the students early on in their academic career because um, the students who graduate from our program go out primarily to do uh, work in primary care and, uh, and they see a lot of pain patients. So we've really emphasized that in, in our curriculum. Uh, in addition, we do a lot of uh, community and, um, outreach and engagement. And this, I think, is uh, somewhat of a result of that. Uh, it's really to um, try to um, go out in, into the public uh, and, um, as Ed mentioned, do both some listening and, and also some teaching. Um, and. Uh, and talk to not just policymakers, um, but also uh, uh, the community and students uh, who um, really um, are the future of, of this uh, work that we do. So um, I think that I'm going to leave it at that and then hand things over to Ed. But again, thank you all for coming. And, and I hope the discussion uh, is very productive today. And as Ian mentioned, it, it really is a holistic approach, uh, that, that triad, with uh, the research and scholarship kind of being one of the cornerstones, but the education mission, which again is interprofessional. Many of our faculty cr uh, cross the, the traditional disciplines and colleges and, and teach and educate in all of them. And, and that's, again, one of our strengths. And then the community engagement is just fantastic. Mike Berman is, I believe, in the audience. And he's led the, uh, the neuroscience outreach program, which has been award-winning and really impactful on our communities, uh, not just in pain, but in head injury, trying to prevent concussions and brain injury, 
and just a general awareness of how amazing our brain is. A, a literate society is going to be able to make better decisions and better investments uh, going forward. So in that vein, I'm going to try to talk a little bit more generally about some of the thought processes that I've had with uh, being an opioid pharmacologist and being kind of at the center of debates on both the pain side and also on the substance abuse, abuse and addiction side. So I, I use the title of being a firefly, and I'll explain that. Uh, when I go to an audience, it can be a group of you know, third graders all the way up to uh, you know, older adults in the general population. I ask them to remember their first bee sting. And it is amazing, about 70, 80% of the people say I've been stung by a bee, and they're more than willing to share their stories. And they're intimate details of things that can have happened decades ago. You know, a bee sting only lasts a moment. The pain associated with it is maybe five, 10 minutes. But you will never forget that bee sting. And you'll know about the setting and exactly what happened and your response to it. You think about that, the power of learning and memory, particularly with things that can harm us. And there's no simple way to forget it. So, you know, if I can pay you as much money as I have, you will not forget that bee sting. It is imprinted in you and it changes your behavior. So think about that for a bit as we delve into this a little bit more. But I didn't want to be this, you know, Debbie Downer. I didn't want to always be talking about things that hurt us. So I turned it around and asked the audience, uh, this was a group of seventh graders, my daughter's class, tell me an event in your life that is really meaningful to you, something joyous, something you know, that uh, was rewarding. And the first girl that raised her hand, she recounted walking through a forest at dusk and kind of opening up into a meadow, and there was all these fireflies, and she had never seen so many fireflies before. And she also mentioned she was with her dad. She was bonding with her dad, and that was kind of interesting. Of all the things to pick, we think about you know, the younger generation, what, you know, it's a Pokemon, I got the latest Pokemon. Uh, you know. No, it's not. There are things that connect us as human beings that are you know, basically hardwired into us as a human society. And for her to recall that and think that that was meaningful was, was really touching to me, and again, showed me this maybe connection with the endogenous opioids that we have. So, as many of you know, that we have opiate receptors in our brain. Uh, we're chock full of them. This is a binding study with uh, carfentanil, which is a mu opiate analgesic, and the hyperintense regions in red and orange are throughout the limbic system. And that plays very important roles in reward, ingested behaviors, and social bonding. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, you know, just by chance, raw opium contains morphine, and morphine fits into these same receptors as the endogenous peptides, the endorphins, the enkephalins, dynorphins. And I was lucky as an undergraduate to be exposed to research that was involved with ingested behaviors. And at that point, it was looking at alcoholism. And the guy that I was working with was a fantastic mentor. He was a psychologist who was also a great pharmacologist. And he was investigating these endogenous opioids, which had just been discovered, the receptors had just been discovered. And he started to lay down a biological plausibly, you know, uh, hypothesis that by stimulating these opiate receptors, it increased bouts of ingestion. And if you block those receptors, it would decrease that. So he made the leap to say that this might be useful in one, types of behaviors like bulimia, uh, particularly with binge type eating. And he also started to think about alcoholism being very similar in many respects to bulimia. Many reports of people losing control. One drink leads to two, leads to five, leads to 10. I didn't mean to do it, I lost control. From an evolutionary standpoint, this may have been very important when we exposed to feast and famine. When we had plenty of food, we overate, packed on the calories to get us through the famine. And on the flip side, the endogenous opioids would also regulate pain. We didn't want too much pain to distract us and prevent us from foraging and, and getting food. So it's an interesting interplay, and, and I got to see firsthand the tail end of this being applied. It was an engineering school. We had a problem, alcoholism. We had a you know, biological hypothesis. We had tested it rigorously in the laboratory animals. And luckily, physicians at Yale and at UPenn decided to test this in a clinical study. The pharma industry at the time was not interested in this. They, they were not willing to get involved in drugs that were used to treat addictions. There was a stigma with it. So luckily, these academic scientists funded by NIH did these studies, and ultimately, naltrexone was approved for alcoholism. But very importantly, he was a great psychologist. He understood there was no magic bullet for addiction. It's complex. It's a form of learning and memory, and that it was going to require a multimodal approach, not just naltrexone, which was only going to work at a subset of alcoholics, but it had to be combined with social interventions, behavioral modifications, cognitive things. 
And I think when it's used appropriately, you do get a lot of people helped with this combination. So at the same time, I was introduced to more of the opioid literature, and I found it fascinating that these endogenous opioids could be modulated with exogenous drugs like morphine and naltrexone, and they were affecting social behaviors. The, the tail in my uh, uh, allegory is the, the dog wagging its tail. When the dog hasn't seen you for a while, it goes crazy when you get home. Right? We all observe that if you have dogs. So deprivation of interaction leads to a hyper arousal when you get home and they greet you. And they were finding that morphine would kind of suppress that. It would kind of take the place of the social interaction, which you can kind of think that if you're socially deprived of some things, it might be alluring to you know, have those effects of morphine kind of substitute at times. And on the opposite side, naltrexone was modulating in the opposite direction. That is still relevant. That was a 1987 study, I believe. This is a 2016 study looking at humans. And this has important implications because we use drugs like methadone, which is a full agonist. We use buprenorphine, a partial agonist. And we use naltrexone therapy for treating a lot of different things. We may have some unintended consequences of that that we don't fully understand. So we need to be thinking when we do pharmacotherapy, uh, we're treating one thing, but are we creating issues with another? Or maybe it's not that big of a deal. But we need to have evidence to guide us in these, uh, these things. So again, I'm uh, either lucky or unlucky to be studying something that is a huge health, social, economic problem. And that is both on the pain side and the addiction side. And if you just look at the sheer numbers, a lot of people are impacted by this. It's a huge economic drain on our country, direct and indirect medical costs. And it derails lives and it changes communities. And we need to start to address it in a more holistic manner. I was you know, down in DC a couple times this past uh, year. And you know, I, I, this is from New England Journal, a premier journal, right? And it's talking about all these heroin addicts that live in our nation's capital. It's pretty scary, those numbers. You know, 17,000, 2.2% of the population. But this was 1971. This has been with us for a long time, centuries, if not millennia. We've been struggling with substance abuse as societies for many, many, uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years. It's cycles. So I've been in Maine long enough to remember, you know, Oxycontin, certainly, and then it was bath salts and methamphetamine, and then it was, you know, big debates on marijuana. So underneath the surface of all this are things that are legal or semi-legal. I'll call nicotine and, and the marijuana question. And then we have things that are prescribed, things that doctors can use and can be perceived as safe and no big deal to particularly younger people that might be at risk for risk-taking behavior. And they start to then have a pattern of use with as reinforced by the direct effects of these drugs and maybe some of the indirect effects as well. So we got to be thinking about, you know, even though the opioid prescription opioid problem may have peaked and prescription of opioids are starting to come down, there's going to be something else that's looming in the future. This, is, uh, the, this year has had the most methamphetamine lab busts in the state of Maine ever. So that's coming down the pike. So I, I kind of make the analogy to whack-a-mole. Remember whack-a-mole at the, uh, the, the uh, fairs, the town fairs? You can nail that one problem down, right? But then the other one pops up and another one up. And then you're just frustrated and you get exhausted. Better yet, we need to be thinking of how we deal with all of these potential issues. Broader is mental health. Another huge stigma, anything to do with our brains, we're uncomfortable talking about as a society. We need to do a better job of destigmatizing and having adult conversations that hopefully will lead to more prevention and early intervention treatments. So comprehensive approach. Talk about understanding pain. We've all had pain, whether it's a bee sting, a broken arm, or something else. We can maybe overgeneralize our experience to someone living with chronic pain. How many, uh, Jim, I think um, Jim's over there, Jim Cormier, he's got a boot on right now. He's going to go shark fishing with me in a couple weeks. He broke his foot. Uh, we feel bad for Jim, right? But we know Jim's going to get better. It's going to heal. He's going to get back on his feet, and he's going to be able to do all the things that he wants to do. Right? There's some empathy there, some understanding, because I can see that x-ray or I see that boot, and I can understand it. Same thing with the surgery. Someone has to go in for a surgery. You feel bad for them. I hope you get better soon. And hopefully the surgery is going to take care of everything. Um, I will point out, Dan, there's no anesthesiologist on board. So I'm a little worried about this outcome that's going to be happening. <laughs> so Dan's an anesthesiologist by training. 
But then we move into some of these other chronic pain conditions, fibromyalgia in particular, low back pain. It always seems portrayed by women, by the way, in the, uh, if you do Google searches for some of these chronic pain conditions, it always tends to happen to women. That's, that's kind of an interesting societal um, issue. Fibromyalgia, though, do you believe in it? Is it a real disease? Is it just in their head? What is the consequence to that person that is suffering from it if it's just dismissed as something that they can just get over, get on with your life? They feel trapped. Same thing with headache, migraine. Oh, she's just complaining again about that migraine. She wants to go home. I've got to turn down the music. I've got to turn off the fluorescent lights. Think about how that makes that person feel. It leads to stigma, which leads to barriers and isolation. And that is a person that becomes withdrawn. Their friends and social support are gone. Even their closest friends, their family members, cannot have that empathy that's needed to see them through. And they stop talking about it. The comorbidities that both occur with chronic pain and commonly also with substance abuse disorders, depression, anxiety, these things compound on that isolation, that desperation, the giving up of hope. And that leads to a darker, deeper pattern that, that kind of sets into the brain circuitry that gets very, very difficult, very challenging to reverse. Uh, but early detection is, again, key if they're feeling like you can talk about it. Pointing fingers. We tend to point too many fingers at opposite sides. It's black or white. It's extremes, yes or no. Life and complex problems are not like that. Right? There's nuance. There's in-between balance that we have to strike. Uh, so I look at these people with chronic pain and these people who struggle with substance misuse. They're pointing their fingers at each other. It's you, the chronic pain patient, that got all these pills out on the market, and that's what killed my son or daughter. The chronic pain patient is pointing their fingers. You stole from that medicine cabinet. It's your fault that I can't get my doctor to prescribe a medication that helps me. Take a step back. Think about it from the standpoint of you have a lot of commonalities, stigmas and that isolation. And if you work together, you combine forces, you're going to have a lot more voices speaking to you know, staff and congressmen and women about changing policy. Insurance companies won't be able to ignore you. The healthcare system will have to maybe make some changes and do a better job. And if you bring in more broadly mental health, that's a really powerful force. That's going to be you know, close to probably maybe half our population. But they've got to be emboldened to speak up in a reasonable manner with evidence to make their case. Working together, rowing up stream together, you can make it happen. Right? So I get asked, well, what are we doing about this at the University of New England? And I can only give you, you know, with the time I have, very limited glimpse of that. But I encourage you, those from the outside, to take a closer look with the Rising Tide and other uh, opportunities you know, presenting today and maybe future meetings that we're going to hold uh, that will have a, kind of like a Gordon Research Conference tone to it. So I, I use this. I can't, you know, there, there's so many great scientists here at UNE that are working together. And, and again, I think our strength is not just pure neuroscience. It's, it's much beyond that. Uh, but I use Jeff Ganter's uh, illustration with this fruit fly larva. Amazing to think about a very simple system that has no susception, no susceptors that respond to things that damage tissue, and they do a behavior to escape from that. That's for survival. For those wasps that try to lay eggs in them, they try to escape. And Jeff's able to manipulate the genetics, and he's able to do various injuries, including sunburns, UV irradiation, that lead to hypersensitivities that might model aspects of pain in humans. And you start to work up from that. You know, the molecular biology, the proteomics, cell-based assays, then the, you know, the in vivo core, and then humans with some of our uh, clinical researchers. That becomes powerful. I'm not going to show the video. Leslie Oaks in our College of Pharmacy is looking retrospectively at charts for people going through total knee replacements. She found over a five-year period high variability in prescribing for the same type of procedure in the state of Maine. She found a general trend for increasing the amount of pills at the time of surgery for pain control. And most disconcerting, she found that about a third of the population that were opioid naive going into the surgery, they were managing their knee pain with other meds and other things, they were still on opioids four months after the surgery. What happened? We can't necessarily answer all that with a retrospective study. We need to have funding to be able to ask 
prospective, well-controlled studies to get at that. We can certainly change patterns by better educating prescribers about how to manage post-operative pain. I am very proud that University of New England was one of the first of the 60 schools that signed on to make mandatory education uh, around prescribing uh, the use of opioids, the risks with them, and a more comprehensive pain group uh, education. In our medical school, as Ian mentioned, we get roughly 60 to 70 hours of training in just the first two years. That is way above the national average. That extends to all of our other health professional programs, too. This is embedded in, and we take this very seriously. So we feel that our graduates are getting a better education and are better able to handle uh, this. The students, as Ian mentioned, we put them out in front of live audiences, not just at scientific conferences. Uh, this is Sam Shepard. She is addressing a bunch of strangers in the Biddeford community, doing what's called a pachakacha or pekakucha talk. Seven minutes and 40 seconds to make her point. She suffers from chronic pain. She told an intimate, personal view of what it's like as a young woman living with severe chronic pain. We've done that over and over again with many of our students and their parents. And we're learning from that. We're learning how to publicly speak. The public's learning from us, but we're also listening. We do, so this one only showed up one of the ones. We do a lot of symposia too, including a couple this uh, last semester. We're working with Project AWARE and a group of youth that have made videos talking about uh, the heroin overdose epidemic that has hit Maine and Biddeford. These are high school kids that chose the topic, made the screenplay, acted it out, did all the videography and mixing, and then have a final product that they're taking around to you know, community high schools and starting a discussion. Pretty amazing to think, you know, high school, I would never have done that as a high school student. So it's pretty cool to see these young people making a difference. This has forced me to come out of my comfort zone. I had had this revelation after the COBRE grant was announced. I had never had a meaningful conversation with someone in chronic pain. I've been studying it for at least 20 years of my life and had not bothered to listen, to look them in the eyes. And I was nervous the first time that the group of people that reached out to me. I remember the first time I met Dale and Ernie and um, Rob Foley. I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. And then I find out they're just human beings. And they've got chronic pain. And there's a lot of nuance to that. But that has changed my outlook on what we need to do, not just in the basic science labs, but more holistically. So this is my lobster out of water, Sean. This was a little bit bigger than the one you ate last night. <laughs> so one of the other things was I was introduced to a mother and a daughter. The, the daughter has complex regional pain syndrome. And uh, horrible, horrible quality of life. It, everything was done wrong. 13 years old, twisted an ankle, no one listened, and it just got worse and worse. And she's now living as a you know, late 20s, homebound, under parents' care. But she had the courage to get here in the spring and talk to a 1,000 of our students and, and share intimate details of her journey. Again, we can learn from this all the things that went wrong. Uh, there was a few that went right, though, too, and there's some hope for her. But the, one of the practical aspects of this symposium that we put together was I was approached by a reporter from the Bangor Daily News. She had a mom that she was friends with that uh, had a daughter that twisted an ankle and the pain was getting worse and worse and worse. She couldn't put any weight on it. And, and she really, really suffering. I said, this sounds like complex regional pain syndrome. You need to find a specialist. Luckily, through their network, they were referred to the Boston Children's Hospital. Integrated care, amazing group of uh, health care providers that took a holistic approach. Early intervention, intense intervention, in-house for six weeks. She is now completely pain-free and living a normal, I think she's now 14 or 15. And she's spoken to a group of physicians about her story. So we are making an impact through education. And uh, this is a video narrative, too, that's on our website, une.edu slash pain. We have a lot of these stories that we're using. It's a personal story. My mom and dad both suffer from chronic pain. My dad's had more recent setbacks. Um, he's got his UNE garb on here to do a little shout out. <laughs> and you know, it was uh, one of the last things that was tried was a back brace that helped him. It wasn't the only thing that helped him. The other thing was levorphanol. Levorphanol is a rarely used old opioid that has maybe some unique properties. He tried all the other opioids, too many side effects or not enough efficacy. For whatever reason, that drug worked. We've seen in Maine, the prices of Narcan has skyrocketed. It's an easy drug to manufacture. It's been generic. It's been around forever. All of a sudden, demand shoots up, and they start to put prices that increase skyrocket. 
my dad, Levorfinol, went from a $20 copay to a $1,000 copay. He can't afford it anymore. So he's starting, I think this week, a methadone trial. Methadone has some similarities to Levorfinol. It has some risks. He's trying to balance with his physicians, his pain doc and his general practitioner, about how they're going to do this. I consulted some of the best people uh, in, in giving him advice and giving his uh, pain physician some advice, too. The legislative, Shelley Pingree, is going to be here later this afternoon. Uh, we have gotten great receptions from all of our main senators and congressmen and women. Uh, we bring people like Andrea, who's a fourth-year medical student, now a resident, doing physiatry in Wisconsin, hopefully coming back to the Northeast. And Derek, uh, Sue Gold, who's at the Chronic Pain Support Group, Kat Hanlon, a young investigator here doing some really great work. We talk. We engage. Senator Collins talking about understanding CARA, which is the Addiction Recovery Act, is important. But we also cannot forget the people with chronic pain. We need balance. Senator King giving us a great shout out on the Senate floor, talking about his observations of the group that we've assembled and the work that we're doing. So in conclusion, chronic pain, substance misuse, abuse, and addiction, and more generally the mental health diseases, are huge health burdens to us. Prevention is better than early intervention, which is better than late stage treatment. We've got to drive that destigma. We've got to destigmatize it. Take the stigma out. Identify and address underlying factors. That's some of the science role. We're going to use basic and clinical research to gain insight. We're going to make incremental progress, but there's things we could be doing immediately that can have an impact. And you're going to hear from some of the speakers later today about that. We want to promise hope without the hype. We can't get burned and, and overpromise. So this is a long process that naltrexone that came to alcoholism took decades to get to ultimately helping people. So we need patience.